15th chapter, and the second one is in the 26th chapter. <clears throat> and I think we'll go ahead and read the um, entire passage I want to look at in chapter 16. And it begins, um, it's a little long, but we'll survive. Um, it begins in verse 13, goes through the end of the chapter. Matthew 16, 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, and that's down on the Mediterranean coast of Palestine, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? You know, I'm not going to preach on that particularly today, but that's the greatest question in the whole Bible. Jesus says to each of us, who do you say I am? Am I God? Do have right to your heart, to your life? Or am I some great teacher, which is a denial of his deity? Who am I? Simon answered, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. The reason for that is simply that he knew what the general population thought of when they thought of the Messiah, a military, economic, political leader who would reestablish Israel's prominence and their national sovereignty. It wasn't that he didn't want people know, knowing that he, who he was. He knew they had a false idea of who he was, and they would, as at other times, try to make him king. And it just short-circuited what he was trying to do. So he said, just don't, don't tell people. 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get, me, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples who had just heard that, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. We'll save the other scripture in 26 um, for a few moments from now. I've been talking to you for several weeks about fundamentally what it means to be, be a Christian. Not only how we become a Christian, but what does a true Christian look like? How do we act? How do we live? We have to do that because from day one, there have been people who claimed the name Christian, but didn't live like that. 
it's still true today. In fact, it's kind of hard to find people who would flat out say, I am not a Christian, I have nothing to do with it, don't want any, I have no interest in it. Everybody's a Christian. The problem is, everybody isn't a Christian. And we've been looking at what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, what I want to introduce us to is a disturbing discovery that eventually comes to every Christian, specifically those who walk diligently after God. I'm not talking about nominal, um, half-hearted Christians. I'm talking about those who are true Christians and know they've been born again and set out to follow God. There is a disturbing rec uh, discovery that in God's timing they stumble upon in their life. It is a hindrance to their very walk with God. It is a hindrance to being the kind of Christian they've started out to be and I trust hope to be, long to be. They discover something still remaining way down deep in the bottom of their heart that hinders walking like Christ said to walk. Okay? And we see it here. This is a stunning contrast. When Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, there's all kinds of rumors and false notions about who you are. And then Jesus zeroed it in. He said, well, but who do you say I am? And Peter makes this great declaration. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Peter didn't have a total concept of the Trinity, of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but enough of one that he could say, I don't have full understanding, but you're from heaven. You're not from here. You're not just a human. You're the Son of God. What did Jesus say to him? Immediately he said, Simon, you son of Jonah, Blessed are you. In whose sight? God's sight. And he said, because you've had an encounter with God himself. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this fact that I'm the Christ. But my Father, who is in heaven, told you. God talked to you. God talks to us regularly. We're not nuts. He talks to us. Sometimes it's encouraging, blessing. Lots of times it's a little uncomfortable. Because the problem with God is He knows the whole story. He doesn't buy our story. <laughs> you know? He, he knows a real story. And the other problem with God is he won't, he won't be what? He can be rather rude. He'll tell you what he thinks, whether you ask him or not. God talks to us. And Jesus said, Peter, how blessed you are because God told you who I am. God has to reveal Himself to us. He has to reveal our need of Him. He has to open up our understanding. Salvation is of God. And yes, we're to do something. We, I'm, I'm up here hopefully doing some good right now. But I can't reveal the deep need of your heart and the only solution, which is Jesus, I can't reveal that to you. I can tell you here. God's the one that has got to take it from here to there. So 
this is of God. And Jesus so commends Peter, blessed are you. Then I want you to notice, this is the same conversation, basically, because it says, at the same time, Jesus began to say, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The chief priests, the scribes, the leaders of the church are going to kill me. And he had spoken to that to them previously enough. They'd heard this before. He said, I'm going to be crucified. They all knew what that meant. One of the worst degrading Roman forms of capital punishment. I'll be crucified. He gave a huge piece of good news. The third day, I'll rise from the dead. They never heard a word of it. You can understand why. They heard this man who we have seen and walked with for almost three years now. We've watched him raise the dead. We've watched him take a little boy's lunch and multiply it to feed 20,000 people. We have watched him walk on water. We've watched him open the eyes of the blind. We have followed him. And he says, they're going to kill me? They never heard anything beyond that. And notice then, this same Peter, who moments earlier, Jesus had said, Peter, blessed are you. The Father in heaven has had an encounter with you, opened your spiritual eyes, <clears throat> showed you your heart, revealed who I am to you, and you've put your faith in me. See the contrast here? Peter, after he hears Jesus is going to be killed, what, what does he do? The words here, he clearly says, 22, it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, this will never happen to you. Now, Peter just said who he was. If I see someone who's raised the dead, opened the eyes of the blind, and he says, who do you think I am? And I say, you're from heaven. You're the son of God. Am I going to, the, the original language here indicates that he, he took him. And the word, he grabbed him. He grabbed him by the lapels. Took him aside. Because after all, we don't want to embarrass him in front of the rest of the people while I straighten him out. Do we get the craziness of this? He grabs him, takes him aside and straightens out the person he just said was the Son of God. And Jesus' response was, what? Well, I appreciate your truth, and I, I appreciate you sharing with me. No. He said, you get behind me, Satan. And the word Satan here means adversary. This man that Jesus just said... You're blessed by my Father. He turned right around and he said, You are an adversary to me. And he said, Why? He explained it. You are following older versions say, You, you savor. Um, you're, you, you are appreciating. You're seeking things that are not God's things but man's specifically yours now what in the world just got revealed here why is there such a shift from blessed are you to get behind me satan had peter 
turned away from God and that however the time was between those two verses? No. No. But what had happened, Jesus revealed some truth and some plans of the future that Peter never bargained for. If you are, remember I said earlier that Jesus said, don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. Why? Because the general feeling was, the general belief was, this Jesus will be a military, political, economic, national savior. He will lift Israel to its previous glory. And he's going to establish once again the great nation of Israel who's now downtrodden by the Romans. Okay? He said everybody else thinks that. Here's the problem. Jesus, of course, knows hearts. He knew that his very disciples had too much of that same notion in their heads. Now, how do I know that? Clear after Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven, in Acts chapter 1, he told, he got the disciples together, and he said, not many days, he says, you stay here in Jerusalem until power comes on you from heaven, and you receive the Holy Spirit, who will be poured out on you. When he gets done talking, what did they say to him? They said, well, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had the same thought as everybody else. This is a physical thing. And if it's a physical kingdom, think about it. If Jesus gets killed, what happens to Peter? What happens to the rest of the disciples? They lost jobs that they thought they were going to have. I don't know if Peter thought he would end up vice president or or if he'd be general of the army, you know, joint chiefs of staff, or if he'd be the secretary of state and travel all over the place. But he knew, I've been in the inner core of, with Jesus for three years now. He called me, and, and here's, here's his thinking too. Man, I walked away from a prosperous fishing business. Yeah, I still got a hand in it. I fish once in a while. But my dad, I'm sure, was mad at me because I didn't, take over the company business my wife who does the budget probably wasn't too happy she was used to some kind of paycheck now I've followed this new guy she doesn't even know who he is we met him on the beach and he says walk away from all this and follow me listen Lord I've stuck my neck out for you and I got hopes for you which are really hopes for me and so when Jesus said, I'm going to be killed, Peter's whole plan, here's the thing, Jesus had a plan, and Peter had a plan, and they weren't the same. If we can somehow grasp what it was and what it is in our lives, God has plans for us, but we've got other plans. And essentially, Jesus just blew Peter's plans sky high with a sentence. And so Peter, basically, Peter rejected Jesus' plans because I got a better one. Now, we might think again, well, that's a horrible thing to do, isn't it? When we have still remaining in our hearts even after we have forsaken all and followed him, walked away from our fishing business, for Jesus' sake, when there is still remaining in our hearts, and there is, in the heart of every human being, excessive love of self, self-worship, that will rear its head in our hearts when my plans are dashed in place of God's plans. And that's exactly what happened here. Jesus said, I've got plans you don't know about. Peter had his plans. And, he, and here's the bottom line. Is we, th we have plans that God ought to Im 
implement for us. So who's God? We are. If we really face it, I want God to endorse and implement and support my plans. And when God says no, we're not going to do that. What, something rises up in here and says, wait a minute. I'm not going to settle for that. In Peter's defense, in Peter's defense, he didn't even recognize that. He never, I don't think he even realized it was there. He didn't conscious, this just erupted out of his heart. This was so stunning and he grabs Jesus and he says, Hey, wait a minute, Son of God. <laughs> Maker of heaven and earth, I'm going to straighten you out. Holder of my breath? What in the world? Probably if he'd had time to think, maybe he wouldn't have gone so far off. But that let him know what was it down here. Jesus knew it all along. But Peter had to see it. And you and I have to see the deeper need in our hearts even after we become Christians. I do not have time. I will find some in the next few weeks, probably. But so far, let me just say this. I don't know. Some of you who have maybe heard me speak on this before have heard it, okay? But if you're sitting here and you think, I've never heard anything like this in my life that a Christian still has something wrong with them. Believe me, okay? There's not a single denomination as wacky as they might be, okay? Way off, I don't care. And line up everybody from Catholic to Greek Orthodox to Lutheran to Baptist to Presbyterian to Methodist, it doesn't matter. They may be far away from believing it and professing it anymore, but on paper, on their statements of faith, there is nobody anywhere that does not believe that once we become Christians, we have something down here that is still lays claim to me and rises up against when God's will confronts my will. Everybody believes that. The only argument comes in is can God do anything about it in this life do you just struggle with it all your life and then hopefully die go to heaven and get rid of it or can he do something about it here my claim is that yes he can that's the only reason he reveals it and that's why he let Peter see what was down in his heart so Peter then gets nailed. Here's what's interesting. He took him aside. I think you know, in, in an arrogant sense of, I'm going I'm to tell Jesus what, what I think, but I'm not going to do it in front of all the disciples. Well, Jesus, I'm pretty sure, said, get behind me, Satan, loud enough that all the rest of them heard it. So Peter's the one that got whacked in public. Okay. Then what did Jesus do? It's too, it's too bad, in a sense. Remember, verse and paragraph divisions, are uh, we've added them, okay? It helps, not opposed to it. But there's really not a... There's not, this is just the next sentence in Matthew's Gospel. Then, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, right, I mean, in the middle of telling Peter, get behind me, Satan, then he turns and he says... To all the rest of them. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's no way that that statement is disconnected from his conversation with Peter. Peter revealed that he was first. Peter was first in Peter's heart. Even though he had given up much to follow Jesus. And he did love Jesus. But there was something down here that was deeper even than his will. Because it erupted without the permission of his will. 
Does that make any sense? So Jesus gives him the cure. You need to deny yourself, he's saying. And you need to take up your cross and follow me. He's just been talking about a cross. And he said, Peter, you need to take up your cross. Now, there's, I can't get into too much of it. There's such a thing, people think that in the scripture, taking up your cross can be cross-bearing for Christians, which is to suffer under difficulties, maybe for a long time, maybe for whatever it might be, financial, physical. We're bearing a cross. It's difficult. It's suffering in, 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 for the name of Christ. But the chief purpose of a cross to these people and to anybody, the people that invented it, was not lifelong suffering. It was to kill you. So when he says, you take up your cross, he didn't mean drag some cross around in a spiritual sense the rest of your days. It reminds us of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer executed two, three weeks by Hitler before Germany fell. And we have a lot of his writing. Most people have heard of him. Lutheran pastor. He just said this. He said, when Jesus calls you, he bids you come and die. Now, he didn't mean physically. But me, my plans, my ambitions, my agenda, that has to die. It wasn't dead in Peter because Peter still had his agenda. And he woke up and realized Jesus' agenda clashed with his agenda. And so he took Jesus off to straighten him out. That's down there. Even in the good Christian. Frankly, let me just say this to you. If you are a nominal, lukewarm, dragging along, barely Christian, which you can't do that for very long... It is no wonder at all, it's no surprise to me, that you don't have any idea that you have an agenda down here that clashes with Jesus' agenda. You aren't walking hard enough with Jesus to even stir it up. The only people that discover that are people that are following Jesus and following Him diligently enough that they begin to realize, you know, there's something here that is off. Something still clings to my agenda when I discover Jesus has a different plan. So Peter and the rest of the disciples then hear further, 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that is, the word here, save, is to grasp, to cling to. I don't want to be repetitious. I've told you before, um, I, don't have, I didn't have that exciting of a life, and so I have to repeat illustrations. But didn't plan, just came, came to mind. My um, roommate in Bible college, right after I got saved and went to uh, college to uh, prepare for the pastorate, grew up a missionary's kid in Burundi and <clears throat> had a piece of ironwood hanging on his wall, big knot at the end of it, all smooth, and then a long handle, probably three foot long, hanging there, weird looking thing, just a big long stick with a big ball on the end of it. And it but it was a killing <laughs> instrument. And then he would tell us these wild stories of uh, how they'd kill monkeys and they would take a gourd and they'd hollow the gourd, dry it out, hollow it out and get everything out of the inside and hollow out the neck just so a monkey could get his hand down it and then they'd put pieces of fruit and nuts and stuff in the bottom of it and tie that thing to a tree or a rock or something and then just watch. And I, I'm telling you, I know I've told you before and you already know some of you what the illustration is, but it's priceless that monkey would squeeze his hand through that neck narrow neck get a handful of what he wanted and that's all it took there was no trap that went like this 
There was nothing that crashed down on, him, on top of him. It was just his fist. I want this. And he said, my bill, my, this kid, college, he said, you could, they would take that big stick and that's what they'd whack him in the head with. He said, you could walk right up to them. And they're jumping and hopping and screaming and doing everything they can to get away because they see you coming. The only thing they have to do is let go. And he said they never did it. Not one. Because, and that, they would jerk, but they wouldn't let go. And they died. Jesus said, you grasp your life, you'll lose it. But if you'll Give me your life. You'll save it. You'll keep it. You'll have it. And it'll be a life better than we could imagine. The reason Jesus, we, we learn from what Jesus says here, that that was Peter's problem. His prescription, the solution to what they discovered, Peter and all the rest of them had in their hearts, indicates what the problem was. He said, you've got to give yourself up, because Peter hadn't. Neither did the others. We'll quit with verse 25. Then, later on, and it's not too much later, but in 26, Peter still hadn't really got the lesson. He had been rebuked and so forth, but in 2631, this is on the very eve of Jesus' betrayal and arrest and crucifixion. Literally, the night or two before. 31, Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. This was at the final supper. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the rock of flock shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Look at verse 33. Here's our dear friend who Jesus loved, Peter. Peter, Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, who knows a few things, says, Tonight, all of you are going to flee me. You're going to bail out on me, every last one of you. Chapter 16 didn't do Peter much good. Because here, ten chapters later, Peter said to him, Even though all, meaning these other duds, the other eleven, the other disciples, even they may fall away because of you, but I will never fall away. So Jesus says, Truly, I say to you this very night, before a rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Three times you'll say you don't even know me. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Peter hasn't learned a thing. Listen, he not only denied Jesus' cross, he denied that he needed his own cross in the sense of dying to self and saying, Lord, you have your way. He denied Jesus, the great physician. He denied his diagnosis of his own heart. Now, we all know people physically. I've pastored all my life. People who, they go to the doctor and say, well, what did the doctor say? Well, he says I've got such and such, but I'm not believing it. I don't know. Okay. One of the doctors who attends here, who's, by the way, in Africa on a mission trip right now, he has a coffee cup. And it just says, your 30-minute internet search does not equal my seven years of medical study. Okay? Hey, I know. What's he know? Do you understand? And even further then, God, God tells Peter, Peter, 
you've got something in your heart that you hardly recognize is there and you don't realize the strength of it and it will drive you tonight to save your own hide three times you'll say you don't even know who I am this is the son of God again they'd seen him raise the dead heal the blind and he says Peter you got a problem in your heart I know you're following me I know as much as you can you love me but you still got something in your heart. It's got to come out. It's excessive love of yourself and your plans and your agenda. And he says it's going to lead you to trouble. No, it won't. Amazing. Absolutely stunning. And we know that very night that Peter's train wreck occurred that night we find just some verses later 69 peter was sitting outside in the courtyard servant girl came to him said you too were with jesus the galilean but he denied it before them all saying i do not know what you're talking about when he'd gone out to the gateway another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there this man was with jesus of nazareth and again he denied it with an oath i do not know the man a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. It's like saying, I know you're from Alabama. Because Galileans had a different accent. And they said, Hey, I know you were up there. I know you were with him. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This was Peter's finally. He got it. He realized, what in the world do I have down here, still in my heart, that would betray my own profession, but also betray the one who I said I loved and I left the fishing business for and followed him. Peter finally believed it. He finally got it. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon these disciples and Peter testified. He said, my heart got purified. Purified of what? This bent to love myself more than God. To elevate my plans above His. To still think I own myself. I want to spend some Sundays looking at a little more detail what this that we, the Bible calls and theology calls and church history calls original sin it's what we're born with it's the bent that's in every human heart to say to god i'll run my own show thank you you come around when i want your help and when i need it to fulfill my plans but other than that you leave me alone that's that's down there it has to be dealt with to avoid the kind of train wreck in our lives that Peter went through. Let's bow our heads. I know I've went a bit longer than I meant to, but I want this to soak on our hearts, and I want us to <clears throat> recognize it and pray for God's revealing, if we need it, in our own hearts. So as you bow your heads, ponder these things in your heart. Father in heaven, I pray that we would do what our pastor just exhorted us to do and just to ponder these things and allow you to search the recesses of our heart. And when you do reveal things to us as we learned in the 
scripture that we looked at this morning when Jesus revealed these things to Peter. Peter didn't even notice it. Wasn't even aware of it, really. 